This goes all the way back to when I was in high school. I had a good group of friends back then, but the one that is most relevant to this story is Mike. I had known him since grade school, so about five years at the time. We hung out a lot, and I knew his family well too, including his golden retriever, Jack. Jack was an older dog, and he was pretty slow. He couldn't run at all, and even had trouble with the stairs at times. Because of that, he was overweight for a dog. Pretty normal for his age, but we all loved him anyway. Mike decided to have a party at his house while his parents were away for the weekend. He invited a bunch of us, and we were all pretty excited about it. The word was going around at school for the week leading up to it, and I even heard some guys who I didn't really know talking about it. It seemed like it was going to be big, so I was getting excited. I arrived with a few of my friends around 7 in the evening. We were the first ones there, so we had some time to hang out before things got started. As soon as I walked in the door, Jack hobbled over to me, and I patted him on the head, then me and the guys went to the kitchen. Mike had the place cleaned and organized already. Anything important or expensive was hidden away somewhere. It seemed like Mike was expecting this to be big, and he had the house ready. He told us that the upstairs was off limits though, which I thought was a sensible rule. I suggested barricading the stairs to make it obvious to everybody, so we took the large bookshelf from the living room and pushed it to the base of the stairs to block it off. You could still squeeze around if you wanted to, but it was obvious that we had intended to block it off. Before long, the house started to fill up. People were hanging out in the living room, the kitchen, and even spilling out into the backyard. Mike seemed relaxed about the growing crowd. He was mingling and making sure everyone was having a good time. I noticed that more people were arriving every few minutes. By nine, it felt like there were easily a hundred people crammed into his house. Everyone was smoking and drinking, and the place was getting louder by the minute. I wouldn't have allowed smoking in the house, but both of Mike's parents were smokers, so maybe they wouldn't notice. They never smoked in the house though, so who knows. The smoke alarms were a real problem. With so many people smoking inside, the alarms kept going off. It was driving everyone crazy, so we ended up unplugging most of them, just to stop the noise. It felt like a bad idea, but at the time, it seemed like the only solution. I started to feel uneasy about how out of control things were getting, but nobody else seemed to care. Jack the Golden Retriever was still up and around with everybody but eventually, I could tell that he was getting tired of the noise. I noticed him lying next to the base of the stairs with a large bookshelf in the way. His bed was upstairs, and I could tell that he wanted to go up there. I walked over and slid the bookshelf slightly aside, so Jack could get through. He got up and slowly walked up the stairs. I followed to make sure he managed to get all the way up. As soon as he got to his bed, he collapsed, and then I went back downstairs. As the night went on, the party grew even more chaotic. The music was loud, and people were dancing in every available space. Someone had brought a few extra speakers, and it felt like the bass was shaking the entire house. The kitchen turned into a makeshift bar, with bottles and cans littering every surface. I saw people I didn't even recognize rummaging through the fridge, grabbing whatever they could find. At one point, I tried to find Mike to see if he was still okay with everything. I found him in the backyard, laughing and chatting with a group of people. When I mentioned that things were getting out of hand, he just shrugged and said it would be fine as long as everyone had a good time. His laid-back attitude didn't do much to ease my worries. I was starting to feel like a parent at the party, like I was the one trying to ruin everyone's fun, so I decided to relax and have a good time. It wasn't my house anyway. Back inside, the smoke was getting thicker. I could hardly see across the room, and my eyes were starting to sting. The smell of cigarettes and something stronger filled the air. People were stumbling around, clearly drunk, and there were a few minor fights that broke out. Honestly, I was kind of surprised that the police hadn't been called yet. The noise was out of control. Around midnight, things took a turn for the worse. I was in the living room, talking to a friend, when I smelled something burning. At first I thought someone had just dropped a cigarette, but the smell grew stronger, and soon I saw smoke coming from the kitchen. I pushed my way through the crowd to get a better look and saw flames licking up the side of the counter. Someone yelled, fire, and then people started to scatter, trying to get out of the house. I ran to find Mike, who was still in the backyard, and shouted at him that there was a fire inside. His face went pale, and he sprinted towards the house. Everyone was trying to get out at once, and it was a mess. People were tripping over each other, screaming, and a few were trying to put out the fire with drinks, which didn't seem to do much. The smoke was getting thicker, and it was getting harder to breathe. 
By the time we all got outside, the fire had spread and the house was engulfed in smoke. It seemed like everyone had made it out, but I wasn't sure. Nobody knew for sure how many people were in there, and I didn't even know all of them. But one thing I did know was that I hadn't seen the dog. Jack was still upstairs, probably fast asleep. Someone had called the fire department already, but we couldn't wait. From the backyard, it seemed impossible to get in safely because the fire was too much. However, when I made my way around the house to the front, it was not as bad. I opened the front door and went inside. The smoke was thick and I didn't know if I could make it up the stairs and back. But just then, I could hear a siren from what could only have been a fire truck. Moments later, three full-sized fire engines were out front. I turned around and approached them, explaining that there was a dog trapped upstairs. Then I went back around to the back where everyone was waiting. The crowd had thinned out considerably. A lot of people must have been worried about getting caught for underage drinking. It was just Mike and a handful of our friends that were still there. In the end, the firefighters saved Jack from the bedroom upstairs. It turned out that he was fine all along because the fire never spread that far and his door was closed, protecting him from any smoke. Mike came clean with his parents and from what I heard, he was in pretty big trouble. There was never another party at his place, but honestly, the whole thing could have been a lot worse. I was hanging out with my roommate Dane one night at our house. It was my third year of college, and we were living in a neighborhood with mostly students. Dane was a big guy, about six foot four and muscular, thanks to playing rugby. We were just sitting around watching TV and talking when I got a text from another friend of mine. His name was Sam, and he said that there was a party and we should come. I wanted to go, so I talked Dane into it. It was only a few blocks away, and I knew the area, so we left and started walking over there. It was about 9 at night, so it was already dark. We had to pay a cover charge to get in, but the beer was free once we were inside. The place was crowded with people, a lot of whom were already pretty drunk. I spotted a few familiar faces, including Sam, who invited me. Sam was smaller and a bit chubby, but he was also a genuinely nice guy. He was in a lot of my classes, so we spent much of our time together at school. Dane didn't know him that well, but they were getting along well already. We hung out with him for a while, talking and drinking. The music was loud though, and the atmosphere was rowdy. Most would say that it was a good party, but it was a bit much for me. After a while, Dane and I decided to take a break and head out to the backyard. We needed some fresh air, and the backyard was a bit quieter. Sam was having a good time in the party though, so we decided to stay. Once we got outside to the back, it was a relief to be away from the noise. We both had a full beer with us, so we just hung out there for a while. It was just a typical college party night so far, and we were having a good time. Little did we know, things would soon take a turn for the worse. After cooling off in the backyard for a bit, Dane and I decided to head back inside. As we walked in, I noticed a commotion in the corner of the room. Through the crowd, I could see that there was a fight going on. As I pushed through, I could see that some guy was shoving Sam around, pushing him up against a wall. Sam seemed scared, and he wasn't fighting back. He wasn't a fighter at all. Dane saw what was happening too, and stepped in right away. He approached the guy and calmly asked him to back off. Dane's size usually meant he didn't have to say much to get people to listen, but this guy didn't seem intimidated. I didn't know him, but I could tell that he was drunk. He looked rough and seemed older than anybody else there. As soon as Dane got his attention, he turned around and started shouting. The guy shoved Dane on the left shoulder and he took a half step back. Before I knew it, they were fighting. Sam got up and dusted himself off, then started trying to help Dane, but it didn't do much. People around us started yelling, trying to pull them apart too. In the chaos, I saw that the other guy had a knife and he went at Dane, stabbing him in the side. Everything froze for a moment as people realized what had happened. Dane staggered back, clutching his abdomen, and I could see blood seeping through his fingers. People started scrambling to get away, and the place was clearing out fast. The guy who stabbed Dane took off too, disappearing into the crowd before anyone could stop him. Dane was on the floor, and I could see that he was in pain. I rushed to his side, pressing my hands against the wound to try and stop the bleeding. There was a lot of blood, but Dane was still conscious and talking to me. Someone had already called 911, and I kept talking to Dane, trying to keep him awake. It was working. 
The paramedics got there and took Dane away, then I followed them outside, where they loaded him into an ambulance. I told Dane I'd be right behind him, then watched as they drove away. A few police officers were there too. They started questioning people and trying to figure out what had happened. I told them what I had seen and gave them a description of the guy who had stabbed Dane. After talking to the cops, I made my way to the hospital. Dane was stable, but would need surgery to repair the wound. He survived and made a full recovery. As for the guy who attacked him, he was caught later that night. It turned out that he was a guy in his 30s who didn't even go to our school. He had a criminal record already, so he was just some creep that must have wandered in off the street. The guys throwing the party did literally no vetting of the guests. They just let anybody in who paid, and a criminal managed to get in because of that. When I was just a year out of high school, I was still living in my hometown. I was working at a car wash part-time, and also taking some night classes in order to qualify for the engineering program that I wanted to attend. Some of my friends were still in school, so it kind of felt like I was still a student. My buddy James was in his last year at our high school, and we were pretty close. One day when I was at work, I was sitting behind the counter reading. There wasn't much to that job, so I was able to get a lot of work done for my classes. Suddenly, my phone buzzed. I took it out and looked at it. It was a message from James saying that his parents were going to be away for a whole week. He invited me and some of the other guys over to hang out as soon as he had the house to himself. I only worked days at the car wash, so I texted back right away, saying that I was in. I went over one night when he had the place to himself. A few of our other friends were there too. His house was a normal suburban place, but they had a really good backyard with a fire pit and a large pool. Next to the pool, there was a small building that had an outdoor kitchen and a small bathroom. The whole backyard area was surrounded by a tall wooden fence, and there were tall pine trees lining the border as well. It was a very private backyard, even though there were neighbors on either side. We had a fire going in the pit, and the four of us were sitting around talking and nursing the single beers that we each managed to get a hold of. As we were talking, one of us suggested having a bigger party at the house. James didn't want to at first, because his parents could be very strict at times. They kept a clean house, and James knew that they would know if he had a bunch of random strangers stomping around there. That was when I suggested that we have it just as an outdoor party. James seemed to like that idea, and agreed to it on the spot. We all spread the word for the next few days, and one of us started a Facebook event for the party. Since I was out of school, I didn't invite that many people, but I was watching the Facebook group every day. There were 25 confirmed guests after the first two days. When I went through the list, I knew almost all of them from school, so it didn't look like it was going to be too crazy. Me and some of my close friends went over earlier in the evening, at around 6. James had already blocked off most of the doors to the house, just to make sure that nobody went inside. They had a large barbecue on the back deck that he pushed in front of the door, so nobody would bother trying to open it. The doors would be locked anyway, but he was just being cautious. By around 7, more people showed up, and by 8 there were about 40 people there. That was already more than I was expecting, but they just kept coming. As the hours went by, I was noticing more and more people that I didn't recognize, and some of them looked older than I was expecting. I saw one group of guys that looked to be in their late 20s, and I have no idea who they were. After that, I went to find James. He was over by the pool with some of our friends, so I went over there. I told him that I was seeing a lot of strangers, and asked if he was cool with that. James told me that it was fine, as long as nobody went in the house. That seemed fair enough to me, so I went back to the party. By 10 at night, there were well over 100 people in the backyard. It was dark by then, but the porch lights were bright enough, and there was a large fire going in the pit. As I walked around the crowd, it seemed like less than 1 in 5 of the people were familiar. I was surprised at how many strangers showed up. A while later, I joined a group of my friends around the side of the house. We were between the fence and the side door, just standing around in a circle, talking and passing around a cigarette. I was facing the house, and I noticed something strange. I looked at the door, and it looked slightly opened. That seemed impossible, so I walked up to it to make sure that it was nothing. When I got close to it, I noticed that the lock was broken. I knew right away that someone had broken in. I almost barged right in to investigate, but I thought better of it. Instead, I went to find James. He was in the back around the fire, but as soon as I told him what was going on, he got up and followed me to the house. 
I wanted to call the cops, but James wouldn't listen. He went right in. Not wanting to leave my friend alone, I went with him. The lights were all off, and neither of us turned them on. I had my phone light out, and that was the only way we could see. After taking a few steps in, we could hear a commotion coming from the upstairs. I whispered to James that we should stay back, but he didn't listen. Before I knew it, he had turned on the lights and started yelling at the people upstairs. I guess he thought they were just some drunk party people who wandered in, but I was thinking of the broken lock. I thought it was more serious, and that they could be dangerous. It was too late to be cautious though, they already knew we were there. As soon as my friend raised his voice, the noises from upstairs seemed to stop. It was an eerie silence as we stood there in the front foyer. Nobody was coming down, and we weren't moving either. Then James started yelling again, mostly just swearing and telling them to get out. No sooner than I had a chance to scratch my nose, I heard a deafening bang. James and I both collapsed to the floor, realizing that it was a gunshot. We kept our heads down, and I still didn't know if either of us was hit. Then I heard talking from upstairs. There was more than one person up there, and they seemed to be discussing what to do. I tapped James on the shoulder and pointed to an open door that was on the left. It was to his dad's office, and it seemed like the only place to hide. We both crawled in and lightly shut the glass door behind us. Seconds later, the intruders stomped down the stairs. We could hear them walking around outside the door for a good 30 seconds before they finally left the house. I still don't know if they would have finished us had we been there, but I was glad to be gone when they came down. Maybe they were just trying to scare us so they could get away, but if they were crazy enough to fire a warning shot, then they were probably capable of a lot of things. I called the cops while we were still in their hiding, and we came out a few minutes later. When the police arrived, they went with us to the back where the party was still going on. When the cops broke up the party, everyone must have thought there was a noise complaint or something. Little did any of them know that there had been a shooting in the house. As people started to clear out, I was talking to the police with James. After combing through the house, they finally found a bullet hole near the baseboard, just past where we were standing at the time of the gunshot. It looked like it was close, and it could have easily hit either of us. We were lucky though, and the bullet missed. There were so many strangers at the party that it was almost impossible to track them down. James and I never even saw the people that were up there, so I knew there was little hope in catching them. That is unless the bullet matches something on file. That hasn't happened yet, but I think it is our only hope. James got in pretty big trouble with his parents for letting this happen, and I don't think he'll be throwing any parties anytime soon. This happened when I was in college. It was back before there were cell phones or the internet. My college was located up in the mountains, with only a small road situated beside the main campus. While it was a very good technical school, the curriculum was very demanding, so there was a high dropout rate. Therefore, the partying could be quite intense to release some of the pressure. I knew a lot of people from one fraternity since we attended the same high school. To be honest, I didn't like any of them. It always felt to me like fraternities were a place to buy your friends and be popular. This particular frat liked to throw a big party in their basement every Saturday night during the winter season. Some of my real friends enjoyed these parties, so I took them, kind of acting like an escort. It is important to note this frat had a reputation for acting like militant fascists at times, so you had to be careful how you handled them when things got tense. Of course, I knew many of them, so it was a bit easier for me. I remember on one particular Saturday evening, a nice looking girl came up and asked me for a light. She wanted to smoke a cigarette. I obliged her and she stood there by the bar smoking openly in front of everyone. Sometime a little later, after she had finished her smoke, some dude came up to the bar and lit up a smoke. Immediately, a bunch of frat brothers surrounded him, asking if he had asked permission. He put out his cigarette and apologized, but I could see the frat brothers still weren't happy and started to shove him. Hey, I shouted out. That girl just had a smoke and nobody said a thing. One of the frat brothers, who was an upperclassman, turned around to see who was challenging them. He stood there for a moment and gave me a cryptic look. He then turned back and told the dude to go outside if he wanted to smoke. This evening there was a large tub full of grain alcohol with purple Kool-Aid mixed in to cut it. A huge chunk of frozen ice floated in the middle. People at the party were getting totally smashed drinking that mass. 
Another frat brother I know from high school came up with a paper cup full of the punch. I took a sip and grimaced. It felt like there was some soft hair in my mouth. I spit it out and stuck a finger in my mouth, fishing a small tuft of soft fur. I could feel my anger begin to rise as I pushed through the crowd to get in the tub. The chunk of ice had melted quite a lot, and then I saw it. There, in what was left of the ice, was a frozen kitten. What the hell? I shouted. My anger continued to grow. A pledge was standing beside me and said, Cool, huh? I couldn't help myself. I made a hard fist and punched him in the face as hard as I could. At that point, I blacked out from the rage. When I came to again, I was standing out in the yard. There were cops everywhere. It's no secret that the local police didn't like any of the fraternities there. I watched in silence while cops were placing some of the handcuffed frat boys in the back of their squad cars. There was an older police officer standing beside me, and he told me to leave, which I immediately did. Later in the month, the fraternity lost their charter. Sometimes I'd see some of the ex-frat members at other parties. They liked to give me mean looks, and once, a brother named Roger started to trash talk, but they immediately left when I approached them, 